So I'm here to talk to you about blockchain technology. Uh, it's something most people don't understand. And so I like to uh, take you back in time uh, just to set the context, uh, because we all understand the internet today. Um, but it wasn't that long ago that very few people understood what that is. And uh, here is how I like to start this conversation. I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Kay said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. I'd never heard it said. About, I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <laughs> yeah, I heard around big or about in the lunchroom the See, week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE com. I mean. Well, what Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about Allison? anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big? How does one, no, what do you write to it, like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up, made up of... Uh, started from. Oh, I thought uh, you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a computer the dictionary. billboard. It's, it's not in it. It's it, it's it's a. So I like to start here because we all understand the internet and we use it. It's pervasive in all of our lives every day today, um, and I think that blockchain technology is essentially where um, the internet was in call it 1994. Um, this is also a, an article from Newsweek in 1995 talking about how the internet's going to fail. And essentially, it's only used by you know criminals, and that it's a passing fad, and it's going to go away. And I think that this is a useful set of context because, you know, what have you heard about Bitcoin? You've probably heard it's insecure. You've heard of this company Mt. Gox that failed, and hundreds of millions of dollars disappeared. Well, the underlying protocol has never been hacked. It is the most secure system the world has ever seen. If you take all of Google's global infrastructure, you know, times a hundred. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, security or hashing. It's over an exoflop, uh, the Bitcoin network. So it's the most secure system the world has ever seen. Um, the first, those companies that failed were essentially banks that left their vaults open. Um, you've also probably heard that it's used by criminals. You may have heard of this thing called the Silk Road. Um, you know, much like the internet was only used for bad things. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, that's not really the case. Yes, there are some bad things done with this. Any, any new technology is going to have uh, a yin and a yang. Uh, you're going to see good uses and bad uses. And as the technology develops, the call it early fringe users become a minority and the call it mainstream adopters end up using it for better things. And so most of the world's top thought leaders, venture capitalists, academics have all said there's tons of merit to this technology uh, and there's more there uh, than that. Um, and you've also maybe heard, oh, that Bitcoin went up to 1,000 and the price has gone down and it's probably going away. Uh, the reality is that it's growing exponentially. Every single metric, if you look at it closely, aside from price, which is kind of the main primary barometer of sentiment, which is the data that most of you operate off of, uh, uh, every, every metric is up and to the right. So what is Bitcoin? Uh, it's digital value. It's fixed supply. It's programmable. It's a decentralized network, which means there's no governing body, there's no central authority, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, which means you can't shut it down. The only way to shut off Bitcoin is to shut off the internet indefinitely. And it's an incorruptible public ledger. You can't counterfeit money. So um, you'd say, well, why now? What is this? Is it something new? So for the last 30 years, people have talked about building uh, a system like this, but no one could figure out how. So if you were studying to become a PhD in cryptography, computer science, mathematics, it's very likely that you encountered this concept of the Byzantine general's problem, uh, better described as a double spend. So the protocols that make up the internet, TCP, IP, and such, um, don't allow for you to create unique uh, uh, assets or individual data. So for example, if I were going to send you an email with a picture attached to it, or money, uh, when you receive that email, how do you know I didn't keep a copy for myself or send it to 10 other people simultaneously? This is the reason why piracy is a problem. And so Bitcoin's creator solved this incredibly complex uh, uh, problem by creating a, a shared database or a distributed ledger. Um, so this is something new. And uh, for the first time in human history, I can now transmit value from one person to another anywhere in the world with no middleman, with complete transparency. It's instant and the fees are negligible. And it's a very big deal. I mean, historically, you've always had to have a trusted intermediary or counterparty in the middle of every transaction, including those on the Internet. 
So Bitcoin was the first application, and I'm not really here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about blockchain technology. So think of uh, the blockchain is the technology that makes Bitcoin possible, and Bitcoin is the first application. So again, think of the blockchain as the operating system, and Bitcoin is now one of about 700 apps uh, that are trying to you know, create innovation around this space, and you're starting to see lots of major institutions uh, use it. But uh, I want to take us through kind of what I think of as the evolution of kind of technology as it relates to uh, what, what uh, is disrupting the world. In this case, we used to communicate with people verbally. Uh, and that was the verbal sort of communication era. Telecommunications enabled us to have synchronous communications with other people around the world. And obviously, a lot of interesting things happened as a result of that. The internet allowed us to have asynchronous and scalable uh, 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 communications with people around the world. And so I think of all of this as kind of the, the internet we use today as the internet of information. Uh, the blockchain is enabling the internet of value. So I can now transmit value in the same way that we can transmit data, again, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Uh, and I think this is going to be you know, hugely disruptive, not just to things like uh, finance. Um, so there's three types of blockchains, um, uh, or two specific that I'm going to talk about. So the current system is built upon uh, centralized ledgers. And if we use this as a database concept, uh, I have a database, you each have a database, and I don't trust your data, you don't trust my data, and that's how the world sort of functions today, and that's why you have counterparty risk. Um, what the Bitcoin network or blockchain, uh, uh, public blockchain is, is it's a giant, dumb, shared database. Think of it like a Google Doc or a, a, you know, a, an Excel file that essentially is being replicated across millions of computers all over the world. And because we're all sharing a database, instead of all having our own individual databases, I don't need to know you or trust you to rely upon that data. And so Bitcoin's blockchain or some of these other public blockchains are these giant shared databases that anyone can operate by running the software. Uh, and so that's a public blockchain. If you've been hearing about JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and most of the world's top financial institutions are talking about incorporating blockchain technology into their businesses, uh, they're not talking about using public blockchains. Uh, they're talking about using private blockchains. Um, which is where instead of anyone having access to it, um, I decide which parties have access to it within a walled garden. Again, I like to use the analogy of the internet, which is when the internet was first emerging, uh, Fortune 2000 companies didn't have any interest in using the public internet. They wanted to use things called intranets. And so this is a, essentially the equivalent of what you're seeing here. Private blockchains that don't have all the benefit of a public blockchain, but it allows you to get some of those things. And I think over time, uh, everyone will end up migrating into a public internet, or in this case, public blockchain. And so some uh, uh, examples of what you can do as you start to digitize assets. Uh, ItBit is a, a company I'm invested in that said, let me digitize gold. So in the same way that I can transfer Bitcoin from one person to another around the world, why can't I do this with other assets? So we can start to digitize the world's commodities. Uh, we could also do that with currencies. The, uh, the Philippines and a few governments around the world have already announced uh, uh, their interest in figuring out how do I issue my currency using this technology. So it's not Bitcoin, instead it's US dollars or uh, Filipino pesos, uh, which is compelling because you've got about 100 million people uh, in the Philippines and only about 5 million credit cards and bank accounts. So there's an opportunity for a government in this instance to issue the, through their central bank or their Federal Reserve a currency using this technology where anyone with a cell phone uh, essentially has access. So you can see uh, you know, five or six billion people on the planet that don't have access to what either, either are banked, I mean unbanked or underbanked. All of those people can have you know, sort of ubiquitous financial services. There's an opportunity for the developing world uh, to uh, essentially leapfrog uh, the developed world, much in the same way that Africa went from having, you know, skipping wired communications and going straight to wireless. Um, here's an interesting example of uh, uh, an art company that's saying, uh, let me issue a certificate of authenticity in combination with that art and so that you can no longer counterfeit art. Uh, I should wear tennis shoes today. Here's an, an interesting company. I guess people collect sneakers. Uh, but this group uh, uh, is issuing digital certificates of authenticity that's an RFID chip inside of your shoe. And if I want to sell that high-end collector's shoe or think a Louis Vuitton bag, I would be transferring that digital token with it because they're unique. You can't counterfeit them. And this will bring about uh, the end of sort of counterfeiting of all luxury goods. Uh, uh, this is another company I'm invested in called Chain. They've partnered with NASDAQ, and NASDAQ is already live doing trades uh, to settle and clear security transactions using the blockchain. So again, in the same way that a Bitcoin could be transferred, 
I can issue a stock certificate uh, using this. And NASDAQ is doing that for what's called their private markets business, which is where you uh, think of big, pub big uh, tech companies prior to going public, things like Facebook. There's robust secondary markets where those stocks are trading. And NASDAQ is already live doing that, using blockchain technology as the way to settle and clear. Uh, stock transfers. Uh, the Australian stock exchange in the region has already uh, announced that they're going to be doing the same thing, but they're looking to do it for the public markets. Um, you know, financial transactions around the world typically clear on what's called T plus three, or you have three-day settlement. Uh, we're going to be moving to a world of you know, essentially instant uh, settlement and clearing, and again, at negligible fees for any financial instrument or asset. Uh, Tyrion, I think, is a, a, another very exciting company uh, I'm invested in, which is focused on land titling uh, as well as healthcare. Um, one of the uh, advantages that America had as a nation is we had a clear chain of title surrounding property, which allowed there to be, you know, mortgages and loans. But a lot of the world doesn't have that sort of clear chain of title. And as we can start to do that with any asset, uh, specifically real estate around the world, I think that that's going to be a big benefit for the developing world. So. Once you've digitized assets and they've all been issued using something like a blockchain technology, uh, uh, by nature it, it's digital. It also then becomes programmable. I can start to, to write rules into it. Um, uh, for example, Augur is a prediction market where, um, think about futures if you're in agriculture. Uh, you might often be buying some sort of futures instrument to uh, mitigate some of the risk around weather conditions. It's almost like insurance. Uh, and so they've built an entire uh, 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 prediction market for futures type trading, but where there's no intermediary, I can actually write rules into, into it. For example, if I took a dollar bill out and I said, okay, uh, I, I'd like to make a bet that it's going to rain tomorrow, one of you may say, I'd like to take that bet. We program the rule into the money so that it's going to check the weather conditions tomorrow based upon whatever data set we tell it to look at and the money will automatically arrive in my wallet or yours based upon that outcome, again, with no escrow agent, no intermediary in the middle. You can program the asset uh, to, to do whatever it is that you'd like, and you're going to, uh, I think, see a lot of interesting uses of that. Um, and so I think we're going to be moving from a world where agreements go from being legally binding to technologically binding. Uh, so if you're a, a young lawyer today uh, in law school, I, I recommend you learn how to code. Um, because I think the law firms of the future are going to look a little like this. Um, and that's probably also true of accounting. But also, so once you've now programmed assets, and we think about things like corporations, um, which are, again, paper sort of uh, uh, platforms, we now have the ability to create corporations or companies that aren't companies in the sense that they've not been legally incorporated anywhere. They're a, a piece of code that exists on the Internet, which we refer to as decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, if you've been following the news this week, uh, I'm going to skip directly to this one because it's very interesting. Dow Hub uh, has raised about $150 million in the last two weeks to create the world's first venture capital firm, but where there's no legal incorporation, there's no entity that exists anywhere in the world, and there's also no venture capitalists. The money exists inside of a digital entity that resides on the web with no governing body, no central authority, no one manages it, and if you've put money into this vehicle, you own a token. And that token entitles you to a vote. And so anyone can now submit a proposal to this digital entity and say, I'd like you to fund my startup idea. And all of the token holders around the world, you know, in a click can say, I approve that, I like it. And if a majority of the token holders around the world have approved that transaction, that startup gets funded. Uh, uh, the prior one is an example of Uber, where they've said, I'm going to create a, uh, a digital marketplace for, for driving. Uh, but where there's no legal entity, there's no Uber, there's no Lyft, and anyone can put themselves in it, and anyone can buy from it, but there's no entity. Uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a piece of software that is the marketplace essentially connecting uh, drivers and passengers. Uh, here's an interesting one called Open Bazaar, uh, which is a decentralized marketplace. So it's an entity that exists on the web where anyone can go buy and sell anything they want, but much in the same way uh, as Bitcoin, it's software that can never be turned off. Uh, so you have permanent marketplaces that are going to exist there on the web. MadeSafe is doing the same thing with storage. So if you have a computer and you have extra disk space on it or a server, I can say I'm going to give 100 gigabytes of my disk to this giant network to create a decentralized version of Dropbox. And so if I want to get storage space, I'm going to pay digital currency for everything I use. And if I want to offer it up, I'm going to earn digital currency by offering up any extra disk space that I might have. Um, Ethereum is doing the same thing with Compute. 
Uh, so I think that much in the same way that the internet has impacted every business in the world and all of our lives, uh, this technology is going to be just as prevalent, though you're not necessarily going to notice it. Much in the same way you used to make your phone calls over twisted copper wires, and when we migrated over to using voice over IP, unless you were in the telecommunications business, you never realized it happened. The back-end infrastructure of the world is about to change, and it's going to get better, faster, cheaper uh, as a result of that. So this is happening now. Most of the world's top venture firms are all invested in the space. Uh, and here's the amount of capital that's gone in. So in, uh, uh, in 1995, the internet raised about a quarter billion dollars in terms of venture funding into those companies. Bitcoin in 2014 raised about 350 million. Uh, last year, uh, Bitcoin raised about 780, call it 800 million. The internet raised about 600 million. So this sector has been taking in more venture capital than the internet did in 1995 and 1996. But the world has changed a lot since that. Uh, it used to cost you about $5 million to build a basic business to sell you know, sneakers online. Uh, today, the cost to build a business have gone down by about 95 to 99%, depending upon the nature of the business that you're building, uh, because of things like Amazon Web Services, because of things like open source software and GitHub, because of things like SaaS or software as a service. I don't need to build everything every time I want to do something. I'm going to grab and compile a number of different technologies to do that. So the amount of capital that's coming to this space is going to create a, a whirlwind of innovation, though it takes time. Uh, you know, that capital has to be deployed into products and services. So I'm financing a lot of those sort of companies. The internet wasn't very useful uh, until you, you know, had some of that basic infrastructure like a, a, a browser and an email client and search engines. So again, like a protocol, this underlying technology needs bridges, roads, and tunnels. And that's, all, that's where all this capital is being deployed today to, to build out that infrastructure and to also provide that technology to existing incumbents that may want to benefit from it. You're also seeing most of the world's top financial institutions uh, have all come into the space. Um, you know, uh, incumbents face the, the innovator's dilemma, which is, okay, I see a new technology. You know, uh, incumbents don't like uh, disruption generally because the status quo is working for them. Unfortunately, you can't stop innovation. So most of the world's financial ins uh, institutions were taking a look at this technology that was emerging and kind of uh, ignored it initially, then decided, okay, I better understand it because there's a lot of interesting people, uh, you know, voting with their feet and their time and their money. Uh, and so the first thing that you do in that situation is you analyze the threats and the opportunities. And like all things, you're going to recognize that there's going to be, this is going to be disruptive in a bad way in some ways. Uh, for banking, correspondent banking, for example, I think is a, a segment of the banking world that's going away completely, but there's also a lot of opportunity that comes with it. Uh, most of the financial institutions are focused on the middle and back office because we've seen a lot of um, innovation on the front sort of line of uh, uh, finance, algorithmic trading, high frequency, mobile banking, that the world's, you know, we've been seeing a lot of progress there, but the middle and back office was still designed for a world of paper, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years ago, and it's very antiquated. Um, and so they're focused mostly on that. You're not going to see a lot of top line revenue growth uh, uh, amongst these organizations, but what you're going to see is a lot of expenses get cut out of the business as they can more efficiently uh, run their businesses on these technologies. And some of the stuff's even older. Uh, take trade finance, uh, and, and we're in a, a city where that matters. $20 trillion a year is uh, you know, being transacted around the world, but we're running on 500-year-old technology, a thing called a bill of lading and a letter of credit. Uh, where you have a, a cargo container and uh, a bearer share that says this is the person that's entitled to it. So uh, that's an area that we're uh, uh, looking at. And beyond finance, uh, most of what I'm financing today are uh, healthcare businesses. So we're doing a bunch of stuff with Philips right now around using this for medical records. Again, uh, uh, the distributed ledger is not only for finance. It's any segment or industry where uh, uh, security matters, privacy matters, uh, compliance matters, trust matters. Uh, and so all of these things are areas where you can see um, opportunities for this technology. Uh, so healthcare, insurance, uh, legal services. I just funded a company called um, uh, Stampery. I don't know how popular notaries are here, but it's a, bi it's a big aspect of kind of trade to say, this is who I am. Uh, and so we've built a service where you can integrate it into your email and you create an immutable record around every document you have, which is timestamped, hashed into a blockchain. And you can always go back and access it. And so for a fraction of a penny, everything you do can be notarized. Uh, and so this, is, again, is not just a finance thing. The, uh, 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 I, I think every industry in the world is going to get impacted by it. But uh, I think I'm out of time. Thank you.